Good morning everybody, this is Stephen Pugh of the Home Bible College. This is our Q&A session and we have uh, lots of questions brought before us uh, today. It's uh, the 6th of August today, Saturday the 6th of August and we're going to be taking a look at some of the questions that get put to us from time to time. First of all we have a question from Patsy, a beautiful simple question. It just says, um, what happens to the soul when we die? What happens to the soul when we die? Now, this question is a very important and fundamental question. Something that every Christian has to um, think about and, and become aware of. Uh, let me read a scripture to you because I do believe that there is one passage in the New Testament that for the Christian uh, resolves the whole issue. There may be other little incidental questions that will crop up, but this will deal with the main thing. It's, uh, it's uh, Philippians chapter 1 and I'm going to begin reading in verse um, 21. Oh, maybe I'll go a little bit further further back. Um, yes, I'll go as far as verse 20. So we'll begin reading at verse 20. So Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, he says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Uh, Paul was in the difficult position as an apostle and as a preacher of the gospel of being constantly in peril for his life. He uh, was threatened all the time with uh, assassination or with um, execution. On a number of occasions he was executed. That's very strange isn't it? Because they would take him outside of the city and they'd stone him to death. Uh, but very often he didn't actually die. Yes, he was greatly injured, maybe knocked senseless, uh, but he would recover again and he would go back into the city and in immense courage he would preach again. And he says, just pray for me. Pray that I'm not ashamed. Pray that the fear of man and that the fear of pain and death doesn't overwhelm me. Pray that in nothing I will be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as I always have, and so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether it is by life or by death. He says, I'm not sure whether I'm going to live or die. Just pray that whether I live or whether I die, the Christ is magnified in my body. And the word there is the idea of seeing something greater. You know, the, the people that saw the life of the Apostle Paul, they saw Christ greater in his life. He says, for, verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labour, yet what I shall choose I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two having a desire to depart to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. I'm sorry, I'm reading from the Authorized Version and the phraseology is a little difficult and the sentence structure is difficult too. It's what I'm used to, that's all. And so he says, let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come to see you or else I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel and in nothing terrified by your adversaries which to them is an evident token of perdition but to you of salvation and that of God for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe in him but also to suffer for his sake having the same conflict which you saw in me and now hear to be in me so Paul is describing his his earthly ministry and he's describing his attitude to death and he says a number of key things he says if I die then that's going to be a gain to me that's going to be a gain 
But if I live in the flesh, then what is the f this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I what not. In other words, I'm not sure which I would prefer to do. He says, <laughs> he says, I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Now, let me ask you something. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul is in the position in which he would just love to die and end all this suffering. He says, but he says, the Lord doesn't want me to do that just now. The Lord wants me to carry on. And so I will carry on. Um, but if I do die, then I'll be with Christ, which is far better. And I presume that what he's saying there is that when he dies, the very moment he dies, he's going to be in his spirit immediately in the presence of Christ. You see, he said in another place that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So there's no time gap. You know, when a person dies, their spirit is immediately in the presence of Jesus. Even though their body's here on earth, it may require a post-mortem. It will certainly require a burial or a cremation, whatever. But the important thing is the body is not the person. The person is the real person inside. Some people call it the soul. Some people call it the spirit. Um, I think that there is a difference between the two, although I understand in the original languages, the word spirit and soul are pretty well synonymous words. Um, but the important thing is this, is that when a Christian dies, by the way, in the New Testament, we never have the idea of a Christian dying. We have the idea of a Christian falling asleep. But the sleep there is referring to the body. The body appears to be at rest and appears to be in sleep. But of course, the spirit is gone and the soul is gone. And the spirit and the soul are with Christ, which is far better. And uh, though there may be some arrangements and though the body may be laid in the grave, um, that's not the real person because the real person is already immediately in the presence of the Lord Jesus. Um, and what are they doing? They're waiting. Waiting for what? They're waiting for the resurrection of the body and the body will rise and go to meet um, the Lord Jesus at the rapture. If you're a Christian and you're in the church, then the rapture is what we're looking for. And when Christ comes to the heaven, to the air, um, he will call all those bodies of the Christians that have died and they will rise to be with him. Um, but we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord... We won't stop any of these people from rising from the dead. No, because they're going to go first. And then we who are alive and remain to his coming, we'll be snatched up as well to meet the Lord in the air. And that word snatched up is the harpazo. It is the catching away, the rapture of all the living Christians into the presence of of the Lord Jesus forever. Now there may be some other little questions that you may want to raise about the details of this. I may not know all the answers to these things, but this is hopefully giving you some pointers. You know, we get all sorts of questions coming into us from time to time. Some of them are terribly sad. Some of them are just interesting. Some of them are academic. They're very the very, very uh, great variety. Let's take a question here. Uh, this this person, P, says, what is Paul talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Isn't it a bit morbid? <laughs> well, hi, P, this is a great passage. Um, like most of Paul's writing, he writes in a style and intensity that's sometimes hard to understand. So Paul is writing a letter to the Christians who live at a place called Corinth. And he has lots of things to tell them. In this chapter, he tells them about the gospel and that in spite of people saying that there is no resurrection from the dead, that actually Christ did rise from the dead. And later he explains that Christians that have died will one day rise from the dead too. That is, their bodies will rise from the dead. You see, the word resurrection is always referring to the body. Now, <clears throat> so he summarizes in this, in this passage the gospel by saying that Christ died and was buried 
and rose again. And that actually is the gospel. That's the gospel. Then he goes on to say, he goes on to list the evidence of Christ's resurrection. He lists a number of people. They were eyewitnesses of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They were eyewitnesses of the Lord Jesus in resurrection. And then lastly, he lists the implications if it were true that there were no resurrection. And the list of uh, implications is horrendous. Let me read them for you. First of all, he says, he says, if there's no resurrection, then Christ is still dead. Now, if Christ is still dead, he says, our preaching is pointless. Why? Because one of the key features of the preaching of the gospel is that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again. Now, if Christ is still dead, then all our preaching is completely pointless. Thirdly, he says, and we are liars because we said that we saw him. He says, and not only that, but your faith is empty. It's hollow. It's a faith in nothing. You have a faith in a saviour that died and was buried. Period. No, no, that isn't how it is at all. Christ, God, raised him from the dead. That's what we preach. We are not liars. We're telling the truth. He also says, number five, you are still sinners unconverted. Wow. You see, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, then there's no hope. There's no hope for salvation. And lastly, he says, all those Christians who have died are lost forever. Now that is horrendous. But there's a seventh thing, just a seventh thing. It means that if Christ is not raised, it means that there will not be a resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then there's no hope of the world to come. Now that is horrendous. It means God cannot vindicate the righteous. It means God cannot reward those that have died. It means all those martyrs died for nothing. You know, when you start thinking about what it really means when, it's, when, when people suggest that there's no resurrection of the dead, then it's quite horrendous. Do people say this today? No, I don't think they do. But in Greek culture, they did. You see, in Greek culture, they believed that the human life is all there was. And when you live your life and you eat your food and you enjoy your life, and when you're dead, you're dead. Now, if that's true, then there's no resurrection of the dead. But the gospel is a declaration that God has raised his son from the dead. That is, I believe, the gospel that is most crucial for today. So Paul is not putting these fo forward these points as being true. He is saying if there is no resurrection, then these things would follow Christ is still dead. Our preaching is pointless. We are all liars. Your faith is empty. You are still sinners unconverted. All those Christians that have died are lost forever. And there is no coming kingdom. Now that is quite an horrendous thought. Now another question that's come in. It says, um, what was the yoke that Christ referred to um, in Matthew chapter 11. Let me read the passage for you. It says in Matthew chapter 11, Come unto me, all you that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, let me tell you what I think the context is. The context is Christ going to a feast of the Jews. And it's a long feast, it's a whole week. And on the very last day of the feast, when Israel should have been completely brought into a beautiful relationship with God under the Old Covenant, a, a relationship in which they have peace with God, a relationship in which they are free from the um, from the, the troubled conscience of sin, 
and they're in this wonderful experience of the old covenant and what's the effect he discovers a people that are burdened and crushed under the weight of pharisaic judaism that's what he discovers and so i believe that christ is saying to the people look come to me all of you who labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest christ was finally offering the kingdom of heaven to israel he was calling on those who struggle under the yoke of the pharisaic judaism to take on a new law which is the true meaning of the mosaic law a law uh, given only to those that are um, faithful jews it is a law for those that believe in their covenant god and it's a law for those that are poor in spirit for those that mourn for those that realize their sinful condition he's calling upon them to return to the lord their god and to come to him and he will place a burden upon them but it's not the crushing burden of the pharisees okay this is the burden of moses it is the commandments of the lord not the ideas of men and the commandments of the lord isn't grievous the commandments of the lord are beautiful he says my yoke is easy and my burden is light i don't mean that the yoke has no weight to it it's just that it's not a great burden compared to the burden that the pharisees and the scribes would put upon israel christ talks about the scribes and pharisees he says they load upon men heavy burdens and yet they don't lift one little finger to help people on their burden so i'm hoping that's helping helping you it's nothing to do with being a christian nothing to do with that and um, it's it's a yoke it is a burden it is law but it's the mosaic law it is not the pharisaic and scribal law <clears throat> now let me read on to another question we received it says this um oh sorry let me just for my find out oh, yes he says when, when hosea married as he was told to do was he in danger of violating the revealed commandments if not does this mean that god in exceptional circumstances asks people to do what would be generally prohibited another example is abraham offering isaac well you're right the lord can ask people to do something that may appear to be contrary to a commandment firstly to marry a prostitute in the case of hosea was not um, to break the law it was something which was socially um, unacceptable people didn't think this would be an appropriate thing to do but it wasn't breaking a commandment of the lord in fact it was actually fulfilling a commandment of the lord because it was regularizing her um, status in society bringing her and the law in a proper way now the example of abraham is also a good example too we all know that being naked in public is a shameful thing and yet isaiah was commanded of the law to do this very thing as a visual sermon you see we must remember that the lord himself is above the commandments and that he said um, and, and that the one who makes the rule can break the rule this principle is taught by the lord jesus who said that he was lord of the sabbath clearly the lord jesus who instituted the law of the sabbath he can uninstitute it too and he and if you see what i mean and he can also set the laws and its applications and its parameters and its restrictions um, the lord dispenses his rule in the world in what we call dispensations now let's suppose you have an arrangement with somebody and you you have a, a duty by law to fulfill a contract if you discover that at some stage something has to change then that person can give you what is called a special dispensation and that means a special arrangement in which there is different um, different principles that are involved and a different arrangement a different relationship and that that word is used in the bible 
It's a Bible word dispensations. And so, so a dispensation then is a particular arrangement that God has with mankind, which is characterized by God's relationship with those people during that time. So um, traditionally, um, um, the, the, the idea is that there are seven dispensations right from the very earliest times of the of, of, of the Christian church it's always been understood that there were about seven dispensations now the fact that people when they are thinking about these dispensations the fact that sometimes get wrong ideas about it doesn't mean that it's all wrong you know we can all be wrong about all sorts of things the main point is that this is about right the other thing that people often do they think that a dispensation is a set period of time May I suggest that there is a certain amount of a time element to it, but the most important thing is not the time. The most important thing is the the relationship that is unique within that dispensation. Um, now, dispensations will often be very different in nature and the laws and the responsibilities may actually be a complete contrast. They may be actually com completely contrary. Let me introduce the seven dispensations of Scripture to you. We have the dispensation of innocence. It's generally understood by Bible teachers that in the Garden of Eden, prior to sin, um, Adam and Eve lived in a, in a state in which they were innocent before God of sin. And the Lord set up this moral law. And that moral law was a way whereby their their faithfulness to the Lord could be tested. You see, prior to sin, they had holiness, but it was untested holiness. And then we have this period after their sin, in which, which is often called uh, conscience, because um, every human being um, has a relationship with the Lord um, under the covenant um, of Eden, but the covenant they're in they have certain duties, they have certain responsibilities, they have to present themselves before the Lord, they have to offer sacrifice, and they have to seek God's blessing. Now, at the, um, at the time of the flood, we have the institution of the concept of human government. So from Noah onwards, we have judges. Now, prior to that, there would have been what you would call the family um, vengeance whereby if somebody died in your family you had a bound duty to seek justice but um, at the time of the flood human government is instituted and for the first time we have the concept that if a person murders another person then society okay in the hands of a legal system will seek justice and will seek um, recompense and vengeance then we get the time of Abraham. Now, the time of Abraham is characterized by the word promise because God appeared to Abraham in Ur of the Chaldees and he gave him a promise. The promise was that in him and in his seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's the basic promise. Now, you'll notice that the, the concept of human government, which came in at the time of Noah, is something that affects all men. Every single human being is in that covenant. In fact, not only is every human being in that covenant, but also animals. They're all in the covenant too, because it was a covenant with all flesh and with all animals. But when we come to the promise, the covenant of promise to Abraham, we discover that that's only to Abraham and to his seed. So this is now restricted to just Abraham and his seed. And then we have, um, in the time of Moses, we have the law of Moses, which was given on Mount Sinai. And, and, and from that moment on, we discover that the whole nation of Israel, or rather the confederacy of tribes of Israel, comes under this special relationship with God, which we call the Mosaic law. It was not something for the Gentile nations. It, they could look on and learn. They could even, if they wished, come and live amongst the children of Israel. But if they did come and live amongst the children of Israel, they had to keep all the laws that would be consistent with Israel. And they also had to be circumcised. That They had to actually completely come under the Mosaic law. Now at the cross, um, at the cross we have a change again. 
Um, and in fact, at Pentecost, we have a change where the Lord takes a particular group of people. There's 120 of them initially, and they're baptized by the Holy Spirit. Uh, they're baptized by the Lord Jesus, shall I say, into the Holy Spirit. And so from Pentecost to the rapture, we have this group of people unique in the world, not dealt with according to law, but dealt with on the basis of the grace of God. That's the church. And when the church is raptured and taken to heaven, there will be that small period of time in which the very last week of Daniel's 70 weeks will will work out its course. There will be tribulation and there will be great tribulation. And then there will be established by the Lord Jesus on earth a kingdom. It will last initially for a thousand years. But this is a kingdom that will last forever, effectively. And all the resurrected saints will be there and all the Christians will be there. And this will be a kingdom of immense blessing. Now, in each of these separate areas, sometimes these dispensations have certain time periods about them. But the other thing to remember is that many of these um, dispensations run concurrently. So, for example, if you went off into uh, uh, the jungles of Brazil and you, you found a Stone Age tribe, you'd find that they they are, first of all, they're living according to conscience. They all know what's right and what's wrong. They all know that there's a God in heaven and they all know what's right and what's wrong. And, then, and, and, and in that society, there may be what you would call the blood feud. So if somebody gets murdered, then the family have a bound duty to readdress that balance. Or you might find that even they in their primitive state have moved into the concept of human government. So they would have a court set up in, in the tribe to judge matters, um, to punish the innocent. <clears throat> and, but you can see how that um, these different dispensations, these different arrangements that God has with men, the, how they can be running concurrently. They run alongside one another. The typical example is that the covenant that God has with Noah is something that runs today. It is something that every Gentile person is in and that God has certain requirements and certain responsibilities that he expects of every human being. But we also have Israel in the world, but not part of the world. And they have a unique relationship with God under the Mosaic law, quite separate to the Noahic law. And then we also have Christians living in the world. And they also have a special relationship with the law that's not Jewish and that's not Noah. It's actually a relationship under grace. Um, it's very interesting that when in, 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 in Romans, when, when Paul takes the four characters of the world and puts them in the dock, he discovers the noble, the noble savage. He discovers the man that's cultured, civilized. He discovers that the man that is a, um, that, that is a Jew, all three of them are put into the dock and all three are pronounced guilty. OK, and they're pronounced guilty because they don't have complete forgiveness of sins. And so Paul's exposition in Romans is how these three types of people come into a right relationship with God. And they come into that relationship with God by grace, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's this this raises all sorts of interesting questions, I'm sure that um, I'm sure that people will have a host of questions, but please ask your question. Not that I'll know all the answers, but please ask your questions. Now, somebody else says, another question that's come to us is, how do I clear my mind when I pray? My prayers get jumbled in my mind and my thoughts bounce about, bounce around. Well, I know exactly what you mean when your mind is very active and there's lots of problems and there's lots of issues your mind can become very confused when you pray <clears throat> now i would rather hear that you get muddled when you pray than hear that you don't pray so whatever happens to you just keep doing that however i might be able to help you because i've had a similar problem in my life as a young christian i came across a very simple acronym it is the word acts 
And may I suggest that uh, you take a pencil and make a note of this, A, C, T, and S. So ACTS, it starts off with A stands for adoration. Spend some time worshipping the Lord. That's what we do at our church. In our service, we often will have a period of open worship. It's not a time to pray for Aunt Flo and her problems. It's a time to worship just the Lord. It's a time to speak to him about himself and yourself and how much you love and adore him. And then C is confession. This is a time to speak to the Lord about anything in your life that's come in, that's a sin or that's a failing, and you need to clear the decks and come into a right relationship through confession. You come into a right relationship with him. And then T is thanksgiving. You know, thanksgiving is the sweetener. It's the thing that makes everything sweet. And try to think of all the things that you can thank God for. When you do that, your life will be transformed. And lastly, supplication. Supplication means to pray for family and friends. So um, Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, I thank God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, making request with joy. So in your supplications, have a prayer list, a list of family and friends and acquaintances, and again each against each name, have a main prayer point. You know, you might pray for Susan, but what do you pray for Susan? Talk to Susan, find out what her issues are. Ask the Lord to bless her in relation to the actual things that she has a problem with. And this becomes an ongoing experience in which you have a living relationship with God, praying for family and friends. Now, <clears throat> the other thing is pray in the morning. We read in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, it says, In the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. So have set times of prayer. And may I suggest that the set times of prayer should be first thing in the morning. Before anybody else wakes, get off into the quietness. Um, in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Now when Daniel knew that, his writing, that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber towards Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed, and gave thanks before his God, as he did aforetime. Another thing is to always pray out loud. I do that. This may be... The most important point, because when you're praying out loud, you might, a lot more of your brain is active. Um, but be consistent and be uh, methodical in what you pray. But pray out loud. OK, um, well, God bless you. I trust that this is a help to you. Now, we have another question here. I won't read the whole question out. It, 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 it just begins. I am now three years married to a Muslim man. We love each other very much. And what she does, she goes, it's a long letter, but she goes into a great deal of heartbreaking circumstances of her family life. She says, I'm sorry it's a long letter, but just had to tell you about all these things. Well, my heart goes out to you. Now, I have no idea all that you're going through. When we read the lives of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, we find that there's too a great deal of really difficult family relationships. So what you're going through, difficult as it may be, is not impossible. And if you devote yourself to Christ, it's not only possible, but it is to his glory that you can live your life in that particular circumstance. I can understand the hurt and the frustration that you may be feeling. However, you have a child and you're in a formally constituted marriage and you now have a responsibility to the Lord to do your best for your husband and for your child. From your husband's point of view, he thinks it's quite normal and reasonable for to bring up his children as Muslims, and you can't take that away from him. You are, of course, free to worship the God of heaven, Jesus Christ, in your own heart. You must, for a while, take a position of a school teacher 
who is neither for or against Christianity. And this neutral position will put your husband and yourself at ease with one another over the whole issue. It seems that the biggest problem you face is the relationship you have with your husband. Will he allow you to attend your church, for example? Will he allow you to talk to Jesus as the Son of God? It's best to come to a clear understanding at this early stage to prevent misunderstandings later. Of course, people can change their minds anyway. As for yourself, you need to be a model wife. Now, Paul gives a lot of advice in his first letter to the Corinthians, and let's summarize some of them here. I'm sorry if this is a long passage. He says, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Defraud not one another, except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Um, but I speak this by permission and not of commandment. What Paul is saying is do not withdraw from one another in providing all of the benefits of marriage, including money, kindness, companionship, discussion, sexual experience, friendship, he says, verse 7, For I would that all men were as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, every one after this manner, um, and another after that. If everybody was unmarried, unmarried like Paul, then, every, then everything would be settled. But this is not the course of life for most people. Then Paul speaks to various groups. He speaks to the unmarried and to the widows. He speaks to the married. In verse 10, unto the married I command, and yet not I, but the Lord. Um, let not a wife depart from her husband, but if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. Now, marriage is generally, the married are generally to remain married if at all possible. Yet, if it is not possible, then they should separate, but not divorce if they can help it. Separation is not the same as divorce. And divorce is the ending of the marriage. Separation is the ending of um, um, daily uh, contact. Um, but Paul gives his personal opinion in certain cases. He says, up to the rest I speak, yet not I. If a, if a brother has a wife that does not believe and she'd be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. In other words, if a man has an unbelieving wife and she pleases him, then he should not divorce her. And the woman, which has a husband that does not believe, if he can be pleased to dwell with her, then, then let her not leave him. So if a woman has a husband that is not a believer, and if her husband is pleased to stay with her, then she should stay um, and not seek to leave him. This seems to be, well, I think this seems to be your situation. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, the children would be unclean. Uh, but, but, but you're not. Um, uh, if the unbelieving depart, this is verse 15, then let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. However, if the unbeliever wants to leave, and presumably wants to divorce as well, then they should be allowed to do so. A Christian is not in bondage to marriage in such cases. God has called us to peaceful lives. And if for the sake of peace, it's best achieved in divorce, then divorce it must be. We all know about very destructive relationships. And in these cases, separation and divorce is best for the benefit of both parties. After all, we all need to live in a certain semblance of peace. Verse 16, For what knowest thou, O wife, 
whether thou shalt save thy husband? And how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? You see, this point is that it might be possible to win your husband or your wife to the Lord. He might be converted to Christ. Um, and this is something that's very much a possibility. Give yourself to prayer, specifically, every day, a lot of the day, that God will bring salvation to your husband or your wife. Now, there's an awful lot more that we can say. This is a massive subject. I'm hoping that this is giving you just enough to be going along with. And uh, if you have any further questions of this nature, then please come back to us. We won't share your details publicly, um, but we might um, um, come on to the question and answer time and just help uh, yourself and others to deal with these difficult issues in life. Now, I'm trusting that this is helpful. Um, please keep coming with your questions and we always look forward to them. And uh, God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. Bye for now.